Hey, I need to um, I need to go to first uh, Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter one, and um, bear with me this morning. I'm going to do the best I can to catch you up. Um, I have a lot to share. If I don't get far, we'll pick it up again uh, on Wednesday night. Please come out on Wednesday. Uh, please write the questions down. You can go here to get sermon notes if you need it. So uh, make sure you get a chance to do that. Um, download them. You can write up on them and do what you need to do. But um, Colossians chapter 1, let me um, read, and there's a couple of things I uh, need to go back and say. Let me see here real quick. Um, yeah, let me back up. Let me back up just a little bit. Okay. Okay. Here's what I want you all to get in your spirit that I'm going to read. Christ, the agent and goal of God's creative act, he reconciles all things through his death on the cross, and he presents believers acceptable to God if they stand firm on the gospel. I need to get all the screens to this one real quick. However, if they can do it, I just want to kind of point that over real quick. Let me read and then let me review. Okay, I want to read something to you. Before I read that, um, let me read you an email. This is cute. Here's an email. It says, hi, pastor. I just want to let you know about something that happened here today. But first, a little background. Joshua, five years old, does not behave well in Wednesday evening children's church if he doesn't take a nap during the day. So when he refuses to sleep on Wednesdays, we bring him into the sanctuary with us. This was the case yesterday. This was Wednesday. So today, um, Rebecca, who is three years old, is praying over her lunch. This is obviously the next day, Thursday. She always refers to Andrew, who, who is 18 months old, as a silly baby. So during her prayer, she says, now these are kids, guys. This is a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and an 18-month-old baby. So during her prayer, she says, thank you, God, for this wonderful food and for our wonderful silly baby. After she is done, Joshua, who's a five-year-old, he tells us, God didn't make him silly. God made him a baby inside mommy's tummy. His being silly is second order. <laughs> How old is this child again? It's a five-year-old Dang, y'all better stop children's church and bring those babies up in here. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Wow, that is, just, that, is just, that is just the most amazing thing. God didn't make him silly. His being silly is second order. Wow. If you didn't get a chance and if you're lost on what first and second order is, grab the, 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 um, the podcast from last Sunday. I want you to get a chance to see that so you can kind of get caught up on what's going on here. Let me read verses 15. Go to verse 15 and 17, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on first order and second order, and then I'm going to move um, fairly quickly so we can kind of explain some things, okay? Verse 15 says, He being Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn um, of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together. Now, I want to talk to, um, I want to talk to this review here. I want you guys to look at these things with me. I guess this is not going good, so I might need to can we go to the review slide? I guess Eddie will need to kind of reset this thing after all. Go to the slide that says review. I kind of want to walk you through this. If we can back up a little bit. Yeah, that one right there. Here's what I shared with you last week. Number one, that Christ is supreme over the cosmic realm. Come on, say Christ is supreme, Christ is supreme. over the cosmic realm. So here's what that means, that Christ is the image of the invisible God. I said that last week. And I'm going to talk a little more about that from a different perspective today. He is the firstborn of all creation, meaning that he existed before creation began. And C, I kind of said some things there where Christ is the agent and goal of God's creation that might have 
sounded funny or might have offended some of you. And I want to take just a moment to clarify that and to let you hear my heart and spirit is never to offend. And I'm hoping you guys, you guys got a grasp of what I'm saying. Let me give you the, the succinct, elevator, ele, elevator version of it. And then we'll talk through this real quick. In Genesis chapter 1, we find that man is made in the image and the likeness of God. And so what that means is that when God made you and God made me, we are considered what we're going to refer to as our first order creation. And so being made in the image and likeness of God, it means that I have creative ability. Does that make sense, guys? Come on, say amen. So what that means is that when God creates me, everything God creates, that's what I, what I refer to as first order creation. And so what that means, God intends that everything that comes out of me ought to look like him. Does that make sense, guys? It ought to look like him. It ought to behave like him. It ought to function like him. It is when second order creation, meaning when I do things that doesn't look like God, that is where sin comes on, to, on the scene. Everybody okay with me? Let, me? let me give you an example real quick, and then I, I need to move into today's message. God, when God created Lucifer, Lucifer was good. Come on, y'all. First order creation. God wouldn't create nothing evil and allow it to be in heaven with him. The issue with Lucifer is that God gave him free choice, just like he gives us free choice. And when we exercise our free choice to produce things that doesn't look like God, that is where sin comes on the scene. So I'm going to say it this way. God did not create sin, we do. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? And, and I kind of gave you some illustrations last week where I kind of messed that up a little bit. And I kind of used the term half-breed that some of you took offensively. And, but I want you to hear the spirit in which I'm saying, and I want to clarify that really, really quick, is that anytime I reproduce anything that doesn't look like God, that thing itself is my own creation, not God. And God doesn't expect me to bring my own creation that doesn't look like him back to him. Okay, so I'm going to say this later, so let me say it now. Um, God created sex. And he said, very good. Yeah, he did. It is man or mankind, let me use gender neutral term, in their second order creation that takes God thing, God's thing and corrupts it. Come on, y'all. God, God didn't corrupt sex. We did. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? All the crazy stuff that we see happening in the world, is, this, this is what I refer to as our second order creation that ends up straying away from God. Don't, don't attribute that to God. Take ownership for it. So here's what I said Wednesday, and I, I don't know if I said this Sunday or not. Quit blaming the devil for the stuff you create. You have the same freedom and creative ability as he had, do the right thing. Come on, y'all. Come on, is this making sense? Do the right thing, do the right thing, do the right thing. And, and, and when we talked about that point C where it said Christ is the agent and goal of God's creation, first order God created, creation still happens today. What it looks like, we ought to take ownership for what it looks like, but God wants us to replicate himself. The beauty of that is point D where it says God holds all things together. And, and the reason that he hasn't wiped us out yet is he's given us a chance to get it right. Oh, come on, say Amen. Come on, he's given us a chance. He's given us a chance to wreck, to get it right. And, and I want to show you how simple getting it right is in a little while as we kind of work through the text. So go with me now. Go with me now to verse um, 18. And I'm going to read verse 18 through 20. And we're just going to deal with those verses. And I want you to take a look at them and to see um, what those are all about. If you had verse 18, say amen. amen. 
Now, we saw first of all that God is head over the cosmic realm. Today we're going to see that he's supreme over the earthly realm. Oh, that's good. He's supreme over the earthly realm. Come on, say, God is in control of the things in the earth. Let's read. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by his blood. Let me read that again. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Now, look at the screen with me, and I'm going to walk through this to kind of get you a feel. Verse 18 said, Christ is the head of the body, first of all, the church, okay? Now, when we talk about Christ being the head, there's a Greek word called kephale, and what it speaks to, the source or the superior one, or he has preeminent status. That means that he has authority or supremacy of the church over the church, and everything as it relates to the church belongs to God. Now, check this out. Don't make the mistake of when you hear the word, he is head of the body, that you restrict God solely to this local church. Okay? This is the problem with a lot of us philosophically and theologically, is we make the mistake into fooling ourselves into thinking that if you don't believe like I do, you're not part of the church. The church is bigger than you, and the church is bigger than me. Come on, do I have any witnesses here? The church is bigger than our individual denominational background. I want you all to lock into this with me. So when we talk about church, we're not talking about our little local assembly. We're talking about the church universal. That means any person who accepts Christ in their life as personal Lord and Savior, Christ is head over them. Very, very important for you to understand. Let me, let me say it a little differently. Anybody who possesses the Spirit of God in them, Christ is over them. And the mistake we make, once again, theologically, is if you don't go to my church, you're not filled with the Spirit. Okay? Y'all listen to me carefully this morning. Don't box God, box God in to the finite nature of your understanding. Let, let me put it this way. God's too big to fit in my head. He's too big to fit in your head. And what that means is that you can't box him in into being restricted solely to your belief system. Y'all didn't get that. Because here's what we do. We go around telling folk who's saved and who's not saved, who's filled with the Spirit and who's not filled with the Spirit based on our finite understanding. God is bigger than what you know. Oh, come on, talk to me this morning. Matter of fact, if you can trap his knowledge on the inside of your head, he ceases to be God and you just became God yourself. You got to get this this morning. So when we say he's head of the church, there's some people who is part of the church of God that we don't even know about. Are you with me? Matter of fact, God is so great. He has the entire world pursuing him because they're trying to figure out who he is. That's the concept of religion. That's what it's all about. People are trying to find God. So when people encounter God and he reveals himself to them, because lock into this, you can't know who God is unless he shows you who he is. Oh, come on, talk to me this morning. And we can go to tons and tons of scripture to look at that. We will deal with that. Um, But it's very, very important that Christ, number one, if he's head over the earthly realm, he's head over the church. Come on, say Christ is head over the church. Okay, now look at the second thing. I want to move fast because I want to get to where I want to get. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Important stuff to show his supremacy over the earth realm, okay? 
All the churches in the earth respond to him. Secondly, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, what that word beginning, this is not the same definition that we lose, used last week to speak about beginning. What this word beginning means is that, you got to get this, is that it, it, it's, it's a temporal term, meaning it has to do with time. He was the first one to get up, and he's also the first one not to go back down. I wish y'all didn't get that. Y'all didn't get that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, 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 and, and there's a lot of scriptural reference that, that we really don't have time to go into and to kind of talk to. Let me see if I can give you this a couple of, okay. The beginning, the first one from among the dead, he was the first to rise, look at the second one, in an immortal body. As such, he heads a whole new order as its sovereign. Now, you and I can't understand this because we haven't died yet. So this is going to do this all day long. Here's what Paul is trying to teach the Colossians. Christ got up, and he's living a life that you and I can't relate to, but the day is coming when you and I are going to get an opportunity to live that same life. If you understand what this means by way of application, when I say to you we've already won, you must understand the truth that we've already won. Look at what he did. He came into the earth realm. Well, let me say it differently. He came past the cosmic realm of which he is in control. Then he came into the earth realm to establish dominance and control. Does anybody in here know that Satan is the prince of the world? Come on, y'all ought to know this. Here's what he did. He allowed Satan to exercise his most powerful authority by killing him, then burying him, and then put him in the grave three long days. Then he said to Satan, is that all you got? Because he got up. Oh, y'all know this. He got up. So here's what he did. He defied the enemy in his own territory. Come on, y'all. Oh, no. Y'all got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. Because when we get to application, I'm going to say this every dog on Sunday. Those of us walk around talking about the devil's on my back. The devil's got me. No, 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 no. You've already defeated him in his own dog on territory. Quit giving him credit. The firstborn from the dead, nobody else did that and stayed alive. Yeah, what about Lazarus? He got up, guess where he's at? He's back in there. <laughs> Songwriter said the grave couldn't keep him in. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of God I want to serve. A God that the grave can't keep in. Buddha died and he's still in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Muhammad died and he's still in the grave. Harry Krishna died and he's still in the grave, but I serve a risen Savior who's in the world today, and the grave could not keep him in. Come on, say amen if you're in here this morning. The grave could not keep him in. I want y'all to see this. Look at that. His resurrection marked triumph over death, okay? He was the first fruit of those who die, and unlike others, he rose. Come on, say never to die again. Say it again. Say never to die again. I want y'all to get that, okay? So Christ was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. I'm going to hit that in a little while. And look at that. He continues to live on the basis of the power of an indestructible what? You ever try to kill a dead person? <laughs> y'all don't get this yet. Let me help you with this. Listen to this real quick, and we're going to flesh it out one day. Romans 6 and 1 says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? And here's how it says, no, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So if you already died to something, why is the thing you died to still killing you? <laughs> this is the beauty of the first fruits. He's the firstborn from the dead. He died to the thing, and he got up victorious over the thing, and the thing couldn't kill him no more. But you and I are being killed every single day with stuff that we've been raised from. You see the importance of this teaching, guys? Come on. 
Come on. When I say to you, we've, we're already victorious, we need to learn, here's week one, how to live a life worthy of the gospel we have received. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, seems to me you just need to know who you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, seems to me you just need to know who you are. Yeah, very, very important, very, very important, very, very important. Because if Christ rose, you, you too shall be raised from the dead. Now, let, let me hurry up. Now, let, this, this, this here is jacking me up, okay? I, I won't get past this because we'll be here till, um, I almost said till, and let me leave it alone. Yeah, now I almost said something. Yeah, yeah, because I almost spoke prophetically and let me just stop, stay in church. Yeah. Um, um, he, he is, oh, the screen went away. He is the fullness. Come on, say, he is the fullness. Say it again. Say, he's the fullness of God. Now, look with me. Look with me at verse 18. He's the head of the body. He is the beginning, the first one from the dead, in that everything he might be preeminent. And what that means, that he may have all authority, all power. Verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. I need to just wrestle with this for a little while. And if you don't get anything about him being supreme over the earth realm, I want you to walk around with this today. Now, here's how I said it yesterday. He is the image of Christ. If that did not make sense, I need you to know, wrapped up inside that fleshly body was everything God had to offer. Whoo! Now, I can't, I, can't, I can't even begin to imagine that. And I know you can't even begin to imag imagine that yourself. But you need to understand, come on, say the fullness of Christ. Fullness. Say it again. Say the fullness of Christ. Fullness. Go over to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Let me just read this real quick, and then we're going to come back. Keep your finger right here. 2, verse 9, and then I'm going to walk you through some things and show you some scriptures, okay? Um, yeah, yeah. Colossians 2, did I say Colossians? Yes. Colossians 2 and jump down to 9. Let's look at this real quick. This is just a couple of reference scriptures. I want you to see them. We're going to walk the same man if you're there. Okay, watch this now. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells how? Bodily. Come on, say bodily. bodily. Say it again, say bodily. bodily. Okay, let me give you this free. This is free. This is free. Look at verse 10. And you have been what? How? Who is the head and rule of all authority. If you can get ahead with me in your mind, you'll see where that verse is going. If Christ is that and you have him in, him in you, imagine who you are. Oh, Jesus, Lord, 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 Lord. Let me slow down, okay? The Greek word pleroma, here's what it means, okay? Total quantity with emphasis upon completeness. Nothing missing that God has that Jesus didn't have. Wow. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, sovereignty, authority. You see Christ, you see God, okay? Full number, full measure. This is what that word pleroma means, okay? Fullness, completeness, totality. Is this making sense, guys? I, I need y'all to get this. I need, if you don't understand, just put your little note and then come Wednesday and say to me, Preacher, how is that possible? And I'm going to answer it right now. I'm going to say, Behold, I show you a mystery. Because <laughs> if I understand it, then he ceases to be God and he fits in my head. Are you with me? But what the author is trying to say, all of Christ is wrapped up in God. Here's what fullness means, Okay. The total of divine essence and power is resident in Christ. He is the one, all-sufficient intermediary, watch this, between God and the world of humanity with all the attributes of God, his spirit, word, wisdom, and glory are disclosed where? Y'all read that a couple of times. I'm doing this intentionally because I don't want you to say he preached at us. I want you to get it. Okay? Come on, say fullness of God. Say it again. Say fullness of God. Okay, look at this. By, refer by using the phrase, all the fullness as referring to God, 
Paul keeps the emphasis on the son to whom the phrase in him refers. Here's the son, flesh and blood. Inside this vessel of flesh and blood is all God. Oh, Lord Jesus. Y'all just go ahead and say Shonda. Just, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is heavy. Let me, let me read, okay? The point is reinforced by the dwell. Don't worry about that word, okay? Um, group word. One that evokes the presence of God in both his heavenly and earthly abodes. Christ fulfills the role of the temple in which one finds the full presence of God and this points to the reality of the incarnation. I will explain. Back up. The point is reinforced by the Greek word, okay, katoikeo. It's a group of words that invokes the presence of God in the heaven and earthly abode. Let me tell you what that means. What this word, group of words says, if you go to heaven and you see God, you're not going to see part of him. You're going to see the fullness of who he is. And it says, so whenever the Old Testament made reference to God being somewhere, even though he's omnipresent, he was there. Okay? So in the earth realm, when it makes reference to God being somewhere in the earth, all of him is there, and he didn't leave nothing of it out. Okay? So now watch this. Christ fulfills the role of the temple. Are y'all going to get this in a little while? Say, Christ is the temple. Say it again. Say, Christ is the temple. I, I need y'all to get this. So excuse me for being elementary for this for a moment. One more time. Say, Christ is the temple. And watch what he does, okay? He, in which you can find the full presence of God, and this points to the reality of the incarnation. Let me give you a couple more big words and I'll explain. Okay, here's a note on incarnation. It reminds us that the Christological Point acquires a soteriological function here. All fullness dwells in Christ so that through him, universal reconciliation can be accomplished. English, English, English. If you understand who Christ is and what lives in him, you will really understand soteriologically what happened on Calvary that allows us to be saved. That's all that's saying. You guys get what I'm saying? If you know who Jesus is, you'll know what happened on Calvary, and you'll know the importance of your salvation. And let me go here and why you can't lose it. Let me go there. Okay? Watch this. What I just said to you teaches you that God was on the cross of Calvary reconciling the world to himself. Did y'all get that? This is what incarnation means. Here's the deal. Let me give it to you this way. God could not find any vessel sinless enough to pay the price for sin. Because everywhere he checked, everybody was messing up. You can go to Adam and you can go to Abraham, you can go to Jacob, you can go to, you can run all the way down to John in the book of Revelation. Every, excuse the grammar, every last and one of them were sinners. They messed up because they carried the seed of sin. And if they were going to create something, they had the possibility of creating second order creations that didn't look like God. So here's what God did. He says, I'm going to do it myself. Now, here's what he said. Now, since I have this earthly realm, and I am spirit, and I exist outside the abode of the earthly realm, and I've already conquered the cosmic realm, because that's my word, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. If I'm going to come in the earth realm, I need to look like earth people. So here's what he did. He fashioned uh, uh, Philippians 2. He formed himself in the form of a flesh and miraculously impregnated himself in this woman by the name of Mary. And he legally entered the earth 
so he could live a sinless life to go himself on Calvary and die for you and die for me. So when you see on Calvary, even though it looks like flesh and blood, it's what's on the inside that matters. Are you hearing me this morning? If we get that, on that cross, God reconciling, let me jump ahead of myself, our second order creations back to himself. He didn't send nobody. He did it himself. He just called himself Jesus. <laughs> You've got to get that. The importance of the Trinity. So let me get ahead of myself. So Jesus goes on, on home, and so for him to come in you, he now calls himself the Holy Spirit, and he, I oh, wish I had somebody in here. And he lives where? In us. You got to get this. Come on. Does that make sense? God himself on that cross paying the price for sin. Here's how scripture says it. Greater love had no man than this that a man would do to lay down his life for a friend, okay? Now, let me keep going. Let me give you some illustration. In the Old Testament, you all know the Ark of the Covenant. Everybody know that, right? And you know how this works. Um, the Israelites, whenever they go to war, they would take the box with them. You all remember that? And, and if they were obedient, God would fight for them, and the box would help them win the fight. So whenever they had this box, it was representation of the fullness of God or the presence of God with them. So here's how the temple came about. Solomon, well, David said, you know what? It doesn't make sense for me to live in Green Valley Ranch with a 5,000 square foot home and uh, God out in the wilderness under a tent. So I'm going to build God a house. And so... God gave instructions on what the temple system ought to look like. And so they build a temple. Y'all know this. And then they put the box inside the inner courts in this place called the Holy of Holies in the temple. Y'all know this. And so when people would sin, they'd have to go find Betsy or some cow, and they'd have to kill that thing, and they would have to give it to the high priest who was only authorized to go into the Holy of Holies once a year to atone for sin because he was only authorized to go where God dwells in God's bedroom to interact for people. So here's New Testament. Jesus comes on the scene, and the temple now... Is no longer such an important feature because he comes as the temple and the box is on the inside. I wish I had somebody in him. So when you saw him, you saw what? The temple, come on, y'all, with all of God dwelling in him. So here's how it looked. They'd go to church, and they'd want to be all holy, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And Jesus would walk around, and he would violate it as if he was violating every law. But he would say to people crazy things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Here's how we said it in John 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here's how verse 14 says it. And the Word became flesh and did what? Dwelt among men full of the glory of God. Now, now let me get ahead of myself. Here's how Corinthians says it now. After Christ died and the Holy Spirit comes on the scene. Don't you know that you yourselves are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Listen, which you have, which is in you, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. I wish I had somebody. <laughs> Therefore, he says, glorify God in your bodies. Quit walking around living these defeated life. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know the price that was paid for your redemption? Don't you know what happened on the cross of Calvary? For crying out loud, you're walking around with the box on the inside. And if God is for you, who can be? I wish I had somebody up in here. And we don't understand what happened on Calvary. Hey! And you've got 
folk that don't like you got you looking stupid and the enemy messing with you. Pray for me that, that you better tell him where to go and how to get there because of who's on the inside. Are you hearing me this morning? In case you're wondering what to say, just go ahead and tell him, go to hell. And I'm not cussing, I'm just telling you where he lives. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? You need to know who you are and what's happening. The theology that's being explicit in the Christology that's manifests itself soteriologically when you come to Christ, baby. Ha! Paul says you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you. He says, neither death, nor height, nor angel, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come. I don't want to offend nobody. And you've got believers having inanimate objects, like a bottle of alcohol defeating you. Come on now. You better tell that thing where to go. Come on. How to get there because of who you are. If Christ modeled it, you can do it and I can do it. We just don't know, so we live defeated lives. We just don't practice this, so we live defeated. Come on, say amen. amen. Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, amen. you better know who you are. Come on, one more time. Say, you better know who you are. Here's the thing. It's, it's about to get heavier and then I'm going to stop because I want to blow your minds. Listen to this real quick. He reconciles all things. I don't know if it was on a Sunday morning I said that, but I think I said it Wednesday night. All is a very, very deep, deep, deep Greek word. It means all. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all it's all inclusive it means all it means all it means it means nothing escapes listen to this the reconciling ability of God nothing nothing escapes I want y'all to hear me carefully I need to slow down right here nothing escapes the reconciling ability of God are you guys tracking with me? Come on, I want y'all to, to get this real quick. So he reconciles the cosmic, and then he reconciles the earthly. Okay, he reconciles the cosmic, and then he reconciles the earthly. Come on, say everything in the earth. Everything. Say it again, say everything in the earth. Everything. Now, let me, let me go through a couple of scriptures, y'all. I need y'all to go with me because I need you to highlight this in your Bible. And I'm almost there. I'm almost there, okay? What is the first one? Second Corinthians, no, Romans 5. Go to Romans 5. I want you all to see this. And the reason I don't have them on the screen, because I want you to highlight it. And I want you to study it when you get home. Yeah. Romans 5, 18. Yeah. I want you all to see this. Okay. Because I'm going to say a crazy, make a crazy statement. You there? Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Say it again, okay? Y'all just put that on the wall, verse 18. Let me read it because I'm going to make a crazy statement. I'll make a crazy statement. Therefore, as one trespass leads to condemnation of all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. In other words, one mess up, get the one right, and then be okay. Verse 19. For us, by the one man's disobedience, the many are made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Go to Romans 8. Back up. Yeah, I'll go there real quick. Romans 8. And jump down to verse 18. Yeah. 
Let's go there. Yeah. This is good. You guys are there? Okay. This one will really jack you up. Say amen if you're there. Paul speaking to the Romans. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not, not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Look at verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Watch verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who, are the, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. Let me just read 24. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he has not seen? Let me, let me, let me, I got to do this real quick before I go on, because I don't want to lose nobody. Here's how I said it Wednesday, not with that text. I said to you, by default, animals are not sinners. Why do you say that, preacher? They don't have the image of God in them. Okay? This is going to sound so crass, but, but y'all forgive me for saying it, but I just need to use this illustration. There's nothing wrong with a male dog sleeping with many, many female dogs. I'm not talking men, I'm talking dogs. I'm going to be clear here because somebody going to misinterpret me. And, and y'all going to ask me another question Wednesday. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. What makes it wrong is humans trying to apply Imago Dei or the image of God to the animal kingdom and we view the animal world through our lens, not their own. Here's what we just read. This is paraphrase, and we can flesh it out. The animal kingdom is saying, I wish y'all would stop doing that to us. If you get it right and look after yourself, listen to this, then we'll be right. But we're wrong only because you're wrong. And until you get right, we won't be right. So quit trying to train me how to be right. You just be right, and I'll be naturally trained. Oh, I wish y'all, y'all. <laughs> Let me go here since we're in Colorado. There's nothing wrong with the marijuana plant. Y'all don't got quiet. <laughs> Let me switch illustrations because it sounds like we got some folk with cards. You know, no. <laughs> God probably made it for medicinal purposes. I don't know what that is. You kind of get what I'm saying? But when we start using it for our own creations, second order, you kind of get what I'm saying? As opposed to God's first order created purposes, let me, let me, let me go here. Let me go here. This is a true story. Um, Y'all heard of the cocoa plant, right, that makes cocaine. I took my wife to St. Lucia, and she'd never seen a cocoa plant. So I said, baby, let me show you a cocoa plant. And I took the thing off the tree, and I opened it up, and she bit into the thing. She's like, oh, dang, it's like good. And I mean, and <laughs> instantly addiction on the first order of creation. She keep wanting to go to the cocoa plant. I'm like, baby, this is the problem we've been telling you. Know? <laughs> and the whole vacation, can we go to that tree again? Can we, <laughs> you know, I mean, the whole, the whole trip, right? Nothing wrong with the tree if you use it for the right purposes. Are you with me? But when you're trying to use it to satisfy your second order creation, that's the problem. And here's what the tree says. Will you leave me alone and get you right so I can be right? Are you hearing me? 
So the creation is waiting. The creation is waiting. I'm almost there. The creation is waiting. The creation is waiting. Let me, let me, let me jump ahead of myself. Go to the next verse. Go to, go to Romans 5, I mean Corinthians 5. Go there real quick, and I'm going to make this statement, and then we're going to flesh it. Is that second? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You guys are there? Now watch this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, wanna, I want you all to see. I want you all to see this real quick. Okay. You guys are there? Then I'm going to read that statement. What verse is that? 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. New creation. The old has what? Not, not, not subjunctive mode, meaning that the possibility exists that it might or it might not. Not probability saying maybe it will, maybe it won't. But it's like an imperative um, that says it's gone. A command, past tense, it's done, right? And then it says what? The new has come. Look at verse 18. All this is from God who, what's that? Through Christ has reconciled us to himself. And this is the part that we miss. And now have given us the ministry of what? Oh, Jesus. Let me, let me, let me say that. Let me say that. Uh, let me say that again. Verse 18. All this is from God who through Christ has reconciled us to himself and he has given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Look at 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sin against them and entrusted to us or gave us the message of reconciliation. Look at 20. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Two more things I need to say. Let me read that statement. Can y'all bring that on the front screen because I want the online folk to see this. Watch this. Second and first order creation are naturally reconciled to God if humankind in their first order created state is reconciled to God. Read it again because this is the the, the point I want you to walk out of here with. First and second order creation is naturally reconciled to God if humankind in their first order created state is reconciled to God. You guys all right? Let me tell you what that means. God does not need to try to reconcile the liquor store to himself. The liquor store is second order creation. We did that. God does not have to close every euphoria store in the state of Colorado because he didn't create it in the first place. You and I created that. Second order creation. God does not need to close down every pornography shop in the world. He didn't create it. You and I created that. Second order creation. Here's the statement. All God needs to do is pursue his first order creation. Second order creation is going to line up. Oh, I hope y'all got that. Let me help y'all. I am God's first order creation. He reconciles me back to himself. Then he entrusts to me now the ministry of reconciliation. If I have a sexual addiction and God saves me, he has given me the power to kill the things that I created. I wish I had somebody in here and start to turn it around for the glory of God. Are you with me? So I don't need to pray for the things that I do. I need to pray for me. I wish I had somebody in here that I may have the strength. And if I have the strength, second order creation does not have a chance because it only exists because I keep it alive. I wish I had somebody in here. I wish I had somebody in here. 
so, 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 if I tell the thing, it's not going to live no more. It ceases to exist. First order creation, if God tells you, you are not going to live anymore, you cease to exist. Pornography only exists because I keep it alive. It doesn't live on its own. Come on, do I have a witness in here? Addictions only exist because you keep it alive. It doesn't have a life of its own. It was not made in the image of God. I wish I had somebody in here. So God reconciles me. And he gives me the ministry of reconciliation. So if you created some bad stuff, you might need to release a flood in the earth realm and start all over again. I wish I had somebody in here that knew what I was talking about. Yay! And call you two of every kind into the ark, just the good stuff. And I'm talking about the ark of salvation, baby. If it's bad, leave it out there. Come on, are you hearing me? Is this making sense? You have the ability to kill it because it only exists because you created it. <laughs> Quit wasting prayers to God for the wrong things. Pray for your strength. God, I really want to shoot it, but I can't pull the trigger. Not God kill it for me. God just need to kill you and bring you into a relationship with him and then teach you how to kill it so you don't reproduce it no more. The reason a lot of us go back to the vomit is because God graced us and killed it and we, we didn't realize that we needed to do it ourselves and we go back to the stuff. But when you learn how to kill that thing, I wish I had somebody in here. Are you hearing me this morning? Are you hearing me this morning? This is the importance of the theology of what is being taught in the book of Colossians. Let me hit you with this last one, and then we're going we're gonna to end service. I just want you all to see this. Look at that real quick, okay? The blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary ah, ah, is the means without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sins. God, you mean you got blood? No, but I gave me some. Because <laughs> I made myself into this person called Jesus. And I died where you ought to die. You get this? And my death and resurrection is proof to the fact that if you die to the thing, I'll raise you up. I'll raise you up. The reason a lot of us can't get rid of him or her is because we've learned to depend on the thing, not God. And God is saying, kill it and watch what I'll do for you. The reason a lot of us can't get to blessing is because we fool ourselves into thinking we ought to help God out. Your created thing can do nothing to help God. Come on. He is, he is the first. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He is the beginning. That's why I like the little song that says Jesus paid it all. All to him. I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but his what? Blood washed it, what? White as snow. We're going to take communion. Here's your prayer. God, give me the strength to kill it. Go back to the book of Colossians, right? Read the first couple of verses. When I heard of your hope, and of the faith that you had in God, I pray to the Lord that he would strengthen you in the full wisdom and knowledge of his word. God, you know I got a weakness with BMWs. Help me to blow up the plant. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I go to God to give me strength to be strong in him because when I get strong in him, as I mature in him, as I grow in him, all my struggles will seem infantile. 
because my hope is in Jesus. You guys all right? Come on, come on, say amen if you're all right. I, I want us to get this. I want us to get this because, and it begins with you knowing who Jesus is. You get what I'm saying? The fullness of God. And then we're going to talk about the flesh next week. And then I jumped ahead to show you how he comes in you. And if Jesus could do it, here's what he said. The things you see me do, greater than these shall you be able to do. Why? Because I'm going to my father and he's going to send a comforter and he's going to come and be in you. There's just one of me. The reason I'm head of the church because it's a whole lot of y'all. So why is all this crazy created stuff still happening when I have my church in the earth, because my church don't know who they are. <laughs> and this is me. This is me. This is me. Y'all can debate me Wednesday. And we're praying for the wrong things. Driving around a marijuana shop seven times. <laughs> That's somebody else's creation. I hope you get it. Are you with me? So teach people to create the right things, and that shop goes away. It only exists because it has customers. <laughs> Bring the customers to Jesus. Watch what happened to the shop. Come on, y'all. Come on. Are you with me? Let me really tick some of y'all off, okay? Go around marching down this for the gang violence. and No, no, no. Save the gang member. <laughs> Lead them to Jesus. And watch what happened, right? Yeah. They'll quit the game. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. God's not after reconciling second order creation. He gave you that ministry. He gave me that ministry. He wants to reconcile us. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Then we go into communion. If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble himself, seek my face and pray. Listen, turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And I will heal their land. Quit trying to heal the land while you're still creating the stuff in the land. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, you're teaching us, Lord. You're growing us up. You're maturing us, Lord. Teach us how to be your people. Forgive us for failing you, God. Time and time again. Oh, how we love you, God. What a great God you are. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you are doing and what you continue to do. The fullness of God dwells in you. We want to live a life worthy of the gospel, God. Show us how to do that.